people attending live on Zoom, but we also have live stream on five different platforms. So thank you everybody for coming and thank you for those who are viewing this as a recording in the future. Tonight we are gathered to discuss a proposal, a proposal for a Black Heritage Pocket Park. This proposed park will highlight what has been hidden in plain sight for a hundred years. Tonight we discuss the future of Exeter's Black history. Hi everybody, my name is Renee Allen and I'm an Exeter citizen. I'm gonna to begin tonight by telling you a story then we'll show a PowerPoint. I'll introduce the panelists. And then after the panelists are done with their topics, Zoomers, you can ask your questions via the chat. We'll only be answering Zoom questions tonight, not on any other platform. Okay, so let me begin at the beginning. Three years ago, I was down at the Historical Society and Barbara Rimkunis gave me this report. I don't know if you can see this is at David tdixon.com. This report is, was this man, this scholar came in from out of town in 2007 and he um, determined that Exeter out of all the towns and cities in, in New Hampshire had the highest percentage of black citizens for some reason. So he wanted to check that out. So I saw this report and it was full of all kinds of people and I had never heard that we had this big um, history. So I went and I looked in some, another book, this one here, Bell's History of Exeter. This one is uh, covers the year 1638 to 1888. So I thought that the people would be in here because they were here for about 100 years right after the Revolutionary War. Um, but they weren't. Actually, there are two pages and it's just kind of vague and it has, I don't know, maybe six names in it. So that didn't work out. So the history is still hidden. So then I went to this one. So this is Nancy Merrill's book with Bill Child's awesome watercolor on it. And I looked in there and I to try to find the black history of Exeter and still still nothing there. Um, where it is, is this one. And it's not what you would think. Um, it's not the true history, but at least there's a lot of mention of black folks. However, they're kind of badly caricatured and it's just, it's, it's not a good thing. But anyway, that's what I was left with. But in the Dixon report, in the David T. Dixon, Dixon report, which I encourage you all to read yourself, you can download it right off his website. It's there for free. Uh, I came across a name of an abolitionist poet, James Monroe Whitfield. And I looked up Whitfield and he published a book of poems in 1853. And I got it. And where did I get it? I got it at Walmart. I couldn't find it in our library, um, but it's still in print and you can get it at Walmart. And this is his book of abolitionist poets. But he wasn't really highlighted in our town in any way. Um, however, in, I think, 2011, he was highlighted by these people at the University of North Carolina Press an entire book on his poems, his letters, um, the topics he was working on. Um, so this guy is kind of a big deal. He's on Wikipedia as well. So he was on Wikipedia and I thought, well, the person who I think has the most compelling story is Jude Hall, Black Revolutionary War soldier. Um, and Jude didn't have a Wikipedia page. So I said, well, I'm gonna go ahead and make a Wikipedia page for Jude Hall. So you can go on Wikipedia now and take a look at Jude Hall. Jude Hall's story is very compelling and it draws us into the stories of the wider black community of about 125 or 150 people over a hundred years. Jude's story is this, he was a soldier. Uh, he came back home, he married a woman. They had many children and uh, his 18 year old son was kidnapped from their home on Drinkwater Road put on a boat in Newburyport, sailed the next day, and was sold into slavery in Annapolis, never to be seen again. Now, that's a horrible story to happen here on Drinkwater Road. And compounding that horrific story is the fact that it, it wasn't reported in the newspapers. Um, the, the authorities didn't really do much about it. I mean, there's more to the story than that. You can look on the Wikipedia page and find out yourself. But we have some other stories. We have a lot of stories, and that's what this park is about tonight. So we have maybe about close to 10 revolutionary soldiers that came to town. We have four preachers. One of them founded the African-American Meeting House in Boston. We have a couple businessmen. One of them, George Harris, uh, when he died in, I think it was 1840, he had 
$30,000 in real estate and $30,000 in personal property. That would be about $2.6 million today. So I say that he did pretty well by himself, for himself. Uh, he had a shop. Actually, it was where it's where Water Street Bookstore is right now. That's the footprint of his shop, a different building. We also have some some good stories about like Kate Hall and she left. Her name was actually Catherine Merrill. If you watch Barbara's most recent history minute or one of her recent history minutes, um, she left a fund of five hundred dollars for the benefit of um, needy black people. We have some bad stories, too. I'm just kind of giving you an overview of and, and so <clears throat> quick overview. So we have William Robinson's funding of the Robinson Female Seminary. I talked to the, some of the trustees and I asked them where the money came from. And um, they said that I was free to go find out. So I did. I, I, I had a professional check into it. So William Robinson, uh, after he left Exeter, after he graduated high school or whatever it was back then, um, he moved to Augusta, Georgia. He married into a wealthy plantation family. He did not have a plantation himself, but according to his tax records and slave records, he had 30 slaves. He had interests in pine. Speculation is that he had a turpentine camp, but that wouldn't account for his tremendous wealth. He was actually a broker, a cotton broker, and he speculated in cotton. So when he died and his money came up here to fund the Robinson Female Seminary, that is... Um, one very, very possible story of what happened or how that money came. We have another couple other bad stories. We got two mobs. We have one mob interrupting an ab abolitionist lecture over at the church on Portsmouth Ave, which is kind of across from Los Olos right now. It's still there. Um, they brought over the fire truck. They squirted water through the window through rocks. Across the street from that, we had another mob on another completely different year that came and tore down a house of a man kind of pretty much just threw him out of town. That was Ben Jakes. We've got the Walker family, Rebecca Walker. She was a female Robinson Seminary alum. She was married at 14 to a Civil War vet. She had six children and she divorced him for drunkenness and abandonment. So she was a single mother of six and she was very poor. Uh, they were buried over at the Exeter Cemetery with not a stone on their plot except for the military stone that the younger son got as a World War I veteran. So this park will remember these people and all their stories. We're, we're going to incorporate somehow a link to a web page of information for, of these stories and more. These stories are currently hit on my personal website page, rm-allen.com, so that you can take a look at them. So we're, we're trying to show what's been hidden in plain sight. Now, why do I have these stories on my page? or this information on my page because I decided that I wanted to spread this story to a wider audience than historians and, and local people. So I said, well, what can I do? So I decided I would write a book. So you may recognize this. This is my first book. Uh, this was in the top 20 this past year at Water Street Bookstore. Then my husband said, well, why don't you write some more? So I decided on a trilogy. So this one recently out. And this one will launch at the Exeter Lit Fest on April 1st. However, it will be on Kindle on March 1st. Now, I'm donating the profits of these to a pocket park. So that wraps up the story and brings it up to this past summer. And I'm going to talk to you now about the, what I wanted to do with my money. So let me get this PowerPoint up. Okay, so I wanted to donate the profits from my book to a pocket park. Oh, geez, sorry. That's not good. Here we go. So I, I went to the select board and I asked him, I said, I want to do this. I want to donate my money to this park. Um, I didn't know at that time that the park would cost way more than I was going to make in profits. I was thinking just a few benches, but I asked to get together a committee and we did. And the committee decided maybe it should be a little bigger than the vision that I had. So we, we put together a mission. We formed this committee with reps from the Historical Society, the Planning Board, the Heritage District, the Racial Unity Team, Swayze Parkway Trustees, the American Independence Museum, 
and uh, Daryl Brown from the select board volunteered for our committee. So here's a map that shows where some of the black homes in Exeter were. They're in blue there. There, um, that's right along Swayze Parkway. The star is the proposed site of the park. Right next to the star is the Baptist Church, where many of this community attended. And then, as you know, up the street uh, where Water Street Bookstore is and Martin Family Enterprises, that's where two very important black businesses in town were, Dry Goods Store, um, a billiards hall, and a barbershop. So this park is kind of located centrally in the triangle of, of this former community. So now... That's my part here. I'm going to turn it over to some panelists. And these people are, are all on our committee. Um, they're all Exeter citizens, uh, so they all have a local stake in it. We're trying to make this a very local project. Um, so I'm going to start off. Uh, so we've got Daryl Brown. He's a select board rep. Lisa Carter owns Drinkwater Productions Marketing. Jennifer Martell is a landscape architect, and she's also on the Exeter Planning Board. Barbara Remkunis is the co-executive director of the Exeter Historical Society. And Dave Short is a Swayze Parkway trustee and owns Stratum Circle Nursery. However, Dave has just called me and he is unable to come on tonight. So we're going to have to skip over any trustee questions um, tonight. So I'm going to stop my share and I'm going to have Barbara pick it up. Okay, I'm assuming you can all hear and see me. <laughs> I'm Barbara Rimkunis from the Exeter Historical Society. I'm also a member of the Racial Unity Team in Exeter. And um, I just want to give you a little bit of the background. Renee's already gone over some of the stories in town. But here's um, Exeter's Black Heritage, which gets overlooked all the time. A census taken in Exeter in 1767 indicates that of the nearly 1,700 residents, 50 were enslaved people of African descent. We, we don't know when Africans were first brought to the Exeter area or when people first began to live here, um, but we do know that in, in 1767, there were 50 enslaved people. After the revolution, the black population of Exeter swells to 4.8% according to census records. That's the highest percentage of a black population in the state of New Hampshire which of course is a small place that's generally considered to be very white. We are still exploring why Exeter's Revolutionary War veterans attra were attracted to um, Exeter, New Hampshire, and why they brought their families and why they settled here. It's hard to generalize about the daily experiences of Exeter's black population. In, on one point, however, there is absolute clarity. Exeter became less racially diverse during the 19th century. The main cause seems to be the lack of economic opportunity in town. As the town became more industrialized and the dominant white population chose not to employ black workers, many people sought to work in other places. Until slavery was banned by the 13th Amendment to the Constitution in 1865, it could be dangerous for free black people to leave the area, to go beyond where they were known by the general population. And that is illustrated in the story of the sons of Jude Hall. As uh, Renee mentioned, Jude Hall had numerous children, at least eight. Of those, there were at least five boys. Three of his sons, three of his sons were kidnapped and taken into slavery. And they were all freeborn men. And the father Jude had fought for his freedom in the American Revolution. Those three young men all were seeking work in the maritime industry, which was one of the industries that was open to them. Poverty often forced people to seek public assistance, which in Exeter consisted primarily of life in the poor house. Most, most, but not all, uh, members of Exeter's black population are buried in unmarked graves in the town cemeteries, both the Winter Street Cemetery and the Exeter Cemetery. So this leaves us no reminders of many people's existence in this town. Black residents of Exeter served in the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and World War I. Catherine Merrill, the daughter of a Revolutionary War soldier, set up a trust fund for people of color, which still exists today as the Kate Holland Fund. 
We're still in the process of uncovering the somewhat hidden history of our town's black heritage. And there's a lot to be learned. At the Historical Society, each time we do a deep dive into one family, we seem to uncover another, which leads us to believe that the census numbers have undercounted Exeter's black population and the contributions to the town have been far greater than has been reported in the past. If we seek to serve as stewards of our history, we must be willing to tell the whole story. And history can be unsettling to everyone. But it's our responsibility to understand and to own our town's past. I think this pocket park will help us with that process and our research is ongoing. Thank you. Renee, should I just pick it up from there? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, this whole project from the first time uh, Renee approached me, uh, it was just so clear that it's in such good hands and I'd like to pick up on something really important Barbara said, which was um, uh, owning our town's past. So I am on the select board here in Exeter, but I was also a select board member in Plymouth, New Hampshire about 10 years ago. Uh, that's further up north. Uh, I've lived around the state. I was born, I grew up in Salem and Derry, New Hampshire, lived in Concord. And um, so in Plymouth, I had the opportunity to serve a term and um, an interesting thing that happened where that town did not um, take advantage of owning <laughs> that town's past. Uh, Plymouth was an important stop on the Underground Railroad, and we had several houses that were Underground Railroad houses, but they were in private possession. And so, you know, one or more of the families uh, went bankrupt and needed to demolish the house. The house was in disrepair in order to take advantage of some opportunity. And um, I have sat on boards and I sat on a board that uh, allowed that to happen. So, um, and it was always fascinating to me uh, you know, growing up in New Hampshire, learning history one way, and my um, my history professor in at Pinkerton Academy and forced me to study uh, Black history topics and um, and how difficult it was in high school. To uh, I remember, I think I came to Portsmouth to um, find materials, and um, it was fascinating to to know that people passed through this way through this whole state. Um, for a number of decades, and then somehow this is the whitest state. So, sorry to meander all around, but the um, you know uh, Jude Hall had eight plus children. I don't think I have eight plus children, but I definitely do have three boys. So that story, you know, Jude Hall has always resonated deeply. Where um, you know it's this is all part of our uh, living history, and um, you know just to share from personal experience, the reason I'm I'm a selectman here in Exeter because I believe it's an important role. I became a selectman in Plymouth because um, as a professor at Plymouth State University, I was investigated as the prime suspect in a laptop ring of, a ring of laptop thefts that were happening in the town. So it was just a bizarre experience that um, was very personal, uh, but very American. And uh, I basically put myself under house arrest for a year while I just let the whole thing die down. And then it, during that time, I got to know all the town elders and um, gathered all these amazing stories about, you know, the clan history in the town and the different underground railroad houses. But um, during that time, I earned enough political capital or social capital that they said, you know, you should really run for select board. And I was not interested. And then they said, you should probably look at the um, org chart of the town. So the police department reports to the select board. So I thought, wow, this is an interesting um, lesson for my three boys, which is um, let's forget about in innocence and let's just claim um, um, equity in the situation. And so I learned by accident, as with many things in my life, I um, learned by accident, wow, that there's, um, there's a really important set of components that go into um, existing and having your existence matter and it's it's an incredible shame that we have so many invisible or vanished people in our state and again renee's you know, work all alone for so long is just it's so incredible uh, but there is such a, a vibrant history throughout the state that i don't know how we uncover it all but um you know having lived a little tiny chunk of it i'm like wow it's it's so masterful how small acts of cowardice and small acts of um, 
um, you know, just short-term behaviors can, can, can vanish history, like forgetting about, um, you know, not putting too many labels on anything. It's like we, um, we have a rich history and somehow we, um, we take the shortcut of saying, oh, wow, New Hampshire is one of the whitest states in the country. Well, how does that come to be with a state with so much, you know, such an inter- integral part of the country's history? So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. But uh, from a select board perspective, it's an amazing dream team lineup of all the – everyone involved is, is just incredible – uh, and I say that with the experience of having worked uh, where history was not a priority and, um, a, you know, someone saying owning our town's past was, was that was not a valued comment. So thank you, Barbara, for, you know, holding up your side of things and Renee and, um, you know, Lisa, from the citizen volunteers to the, um, you know, all the local stakeholders are just, you know, it's a phenomenal combination. So if I had a hat, I would take it off. So, thanks. Daryl, that was great. Um, unbelie- unbelievable story. I, I don't think I had, had heard your story. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm moved by what um, you just shared um, with the public. That was, that was in, endearing. Um, I'm Lisa Carter. I'm the uh, founder of Drinkwater Marketing. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm, I, I'm humbled to be um, in the room with people, people like uh, the, the other panelists. Um, but when Renee came to me um, and told me the stories uh, that were shared tonight, um, we took a, a nice walk downtown, um, freezing cold, and we kind of chatted. And I, and I thought to myself, this pro- pocket project, uh, po- po- uh, po- pocket park project, um, sounds amazing. But what could I do? Um, I, I'm a marketer. Um, I have a team of people, but I, I, um, I felt um, the need to, to participate because I am a mother in town. I have, uh, I'm the, a mother of three uh, African-American males, um, two of which have already gone through SAU 16. I have one more um, who's, who's in seventh grade, who, who's going to hopefully breeze right through. Um, and I felt it uh, my duty, to be quite honest, to be involved in um, a project like this um, that, that was so in, in endearing and close to home. Uh, when I hear about all of those uh, people of color who came before me, um, no matter what their economic status was, they participated um, as residents and community members um, in the town of Exeter. Um, so actually I, I employed my, the team that, um, to kind of come up with three, we call it three C's. And, and the first one that we thought how we could participate um, and add to this project as a marketing entity was community engagement. And um, the first thing I thought about was the African proverb that when we travel together, we travel farther. And so while today is just the first step of bringing together, there's 26 attendees um, in, in, on the uh, Zoom meeting, um, to be able to maybe use other groups in social media, we interact with Facebook, um, and LinkedIn, and, and other digital tools and we thought maybe we can bring together the community to understand more about these stories, dive deeper, understand the purpose, um, have it as a portal of feedback, a source of engagement in the process um, if we are to move forward with the development plan of Pocket Park. The second C was collaboration. I thought um, I know of uh, the African uh, Heritage Trail and other groups in the state. Um, I'm also very close to some of the initiatives on diversity um, and, and racial equity. And I thought, wow, this will be a great um, collaboration if the town of Exeter could join um, and represent the his- historical milestones and markers um, in the town, be a part of the overall arching initiatives that are going on in the state that I'm so proud um, to, to, to be a part of. Um, I think there's a lots of opportunity to, to add uh, to the history of the uh, state of New Hampshire. Um, and then the last one was really about the continuation. We are sitting here today, um, February 19th, um, smack dab in the middle of Black History Month, having uh, an incredible conversation about the purpose um, of a pocket park, um, the future of a, po- a pocket park, and, and the history behind um, why one, one woman and a few people came together as a committee uh, to bring this to a broader audience. And in that continuation, I can definitely envision the, um, the, the future and the opportunity of historians from not only uh, the town, the state and beyond nationally, there is so much uh, visibility and light being sh- uh, shown on 
what the journey was of the African um, in this country. So I think that um, Exeter could play a huge role in telling some of that story, some of those uh, blank uh, sentences that are out there um, that we should that uh, the panelists shared with you earlier. Some of those stories that it kind of just dropped off. We could really add to um, the the uh, rich, diverse culture um, and share that with the national audience. So um, we are actually <laughs> making history with this call tonight. And I, I'm very proud to be a part of it. So thank you. And I think I'm next. Um, Renee, can you pull up my slides by any chance or should I pull them up? Oh, thank you. Um, so my name is Jennifer Martell. I'm a landscape architect um, locally. Um, my job is to design and oversee implementations of parks just like this. Um, I do a lot of um, parks, waterfronts, streetscapes, and uh, memorials and commemorative sites just like this. So when I heard about this project um, taking place on Swayze Parkway, I thought, wow, this is such a great, amazing idea. And I reached out to Renee to see um, how I could help. Um, so Swayze Parkway is really a green gem um, in downtown Exeter, and I know it's used um, by just so many people in so many different ways, large groups, small groups, uh, walkers, um, runners, kids. Um, it's just, you know, people love the parkway. And it's really important that the parkway is designed um, and implemented with the utmost respect to Swayze Parkway and, um, and its users. Um, so I'm going to just talk really quickly about the design concept that we've been developing um, as a committee over the past several months. And just as you see these images, just try to keep in mind that this is just a, a concept at this point. Nothing is really set in stone. Um, and as Ray, Renee mentioned, um, it's not totally funded at this point. The committee will be you know, starting a fundraising campaign, hopefully, after this meeting. Um, and looking for, you know, grants and donations to help um, implement the full vision for the park. So the proposed location is on the Water Street end of Swayze Parkway, um, and it's just inside the stone walls adjacent to the 225 Water Street building. Um, the space is enclosed um, by a fence on two sides as a chain link fence that I believe belongs to the adjacent parcel. It's not part of the parkway, um, as far as I know. Um, and the two, like I said, the 225 Water Street building is directly west of the site. And just um, as you're looking at this rendering, I just want to point out there was some um, artistic license taken that to imagine the parkway as being permanently closed to vehicular traffic, except for event traffic and emergency vehicles. So basically, um, the condition that it's in today with people, with it being mostly pedestrian only, um, would be a permanent condition as shown in this drawing. Um, next slide, please. So this is um, what the space looks like um, today or over the summer, not today, obviously. Um, the site gets um, some really nice morning sun and then it gets shaded in the afternoon. Um, there are a few existing large pine trees um, on the site which are so a little bit problematic. Stuff doesn't really like to grow underneath pine trees. They have very shallow root systems um, and they drop needles and um, their branches tend to fall. So we would definitely work on cleaning up the existing vegetation in the site. Um, and you can kind of see the grass isn't really growing well in, in this location. Um, so this project would help sort of clean up the landscape in this particular location. Um, the site currently is not ADA accessible, and that's something that's really important in everything I design, is that um, anyone should be able to access the site, um, whether they're in a wheelchair, whether they're using a walker, whether um, they're pushing a stroller. So um, there is a currently a six inch curb that prevents access for people with limited mobility that would have to be addressed. Um, and I did take a look at available survey data. We don't have a specific survey for this project, but the review of what we do have from previous projects indicates that there's um, likely no utility conflicts, which is good news. Next slide, please. Um, 
initially when I looked at this, you know, I was just kind of curious about flooding because as we do know, um, this whole area is sort of a flood zone. Um, the actual site that we're looking at is, is one of the higher ground sites on the parkway. Um, about half the site is in the 0.2% um, annual chance flood hazard um, and the project, and it's about two feet above base flood elevation. And just for comparison, the majority of Swayze Parkway is in the 1% annual chance flood hazard area. Um, so this site, um, we probably, generally you don't need to worry about flood zones for um, park amenities, except to consider that there's gonna be some point that there probably, <laughs> there's gonna be water, standing water on the site. Um, so you don't wanna install things that are loose or might move or might rust, for example. Um, next slide. So um, this is the design that we've, um, that the committee has come up with so far. Um, like I mentioned, there would be a curve cut, curb cut um, and some additional pavement to provide accessibility to the, to the small plaza. Um, we're showing a 10 foot by 10 foot paved area with two benches. Um, I'm calling them conversation benches because they're sort of arranged so people can sit and talk to each other and discuss. Um, and then the central part of the site would be, um, the, the main feature would be some kind of um, monument. And this is really just a placeholder, what you see here. The idea is that um, it would be really thoughtfully designed and we could, I'm hoping, bring an artist in to do something um, somewhat sculptural, sculptural and evocative. And um, like Renee mentioned, there would probably be some kind of QR code, um, you know, engraved into the monuments so to bring you to the website so that you can hear about and learn about all those stories um, while, while you're here. Um, and like I mentioned, some of the existing plantings, um, you know, we're hoping we can um, get the money to clean them up and maybe plant some new, put some new planting beds here with low maintenance plantings, um, new grass, et cetera, really help, help clean the place up and create a really um, comfortable and enjoyable place to, um, to sit and to contemplate and to discuss. And that's all I had, thanks. Well, thank you to all the panelists. And um, I'd like to add here that Dave Short was um, going to be on the call tonight to represent the Swayze trustees, and he suddenly was unavailable. Um, but I'd just like to assure the people that, you know, we are, the, the trustees are on our committee. Um, I wouldn't bring Forth this project unless I thought it was win-win for everybody. I think that the um, citizens will kind of rise up and, and get some grant money and some donations to kind of gift the parkway with this um, spiffy area. And um, and that and that it's um, currently in an area that's not used very much. There's no sidewalk through it. There's no crosswalk to it. It's an area that probably the majority of us have never stepped foot on. Um, so it almost feels to me that it's, it's not um, a disruptive to the park. It almost feels to me like that piece of the park is adjacent to the sidewalk near the, the lawyer's building. Like you would come out of St. Anthony's with your coffee and you just tuck in around the corner and, and you know, have a little coffee in that, that quiet spot and, and think about uh, racial unity. So um, now that we are all done here, I think we're going to try to see if anybody has any questions in the chat and see who wants to take them. Okay, I see some nice comments, but no questions. So if anybody in our attendee panel has any questions, if you could type them in now, I will pass them on to the correct panelist. I do have a question for Lisa. <laughs> okay. Did you know the history of Drinkwater Road before when you named your company? I did not. I did not. Um, so you can imagine um, the conversation that um, Renee and I had as we took our <laughs> we've taken our walks, and I'm blown away. So I did not know that. Okay, so I have a question in here from Betsy Ferguson, and um, this might be a question for Dave Short, Swayze trustee, who is not here with us, but uh, maybe I don't know, maybe one of us can answer it. Is the proposed park at park site? site available to purchase? I don't know the true answer to that, but I believe that it is owned by the Swayze 
it's, it's part of Swayze, and I don't think it can ever be divested from Swayze, but I may be wrong on that. Uh, as a select board rep, do you have any yeah, I think that's comment right. there? Right, it belongs to the trustee, the Swayze Trust Fund, the tr trustees are in guardianship of that, so there's not a, I don't think there's a situation where it would be purchasable. Um, yeah. So, short answer, not available to purchase. Okay, see another question coming in here from Jonathan Ring. Please tell us about the Cutler plaque. Oh, okay. Well, I guess that one's for me. Um, many of you may have seen in the newspaper that last week, um, Sandy Martin, who owns Martin Family Enterprises, and I put a plaque on his building. Sandy, uh, I, I had uh, in my third book right here, I'm talking about the Cutler, and this is John Garrison Cutler, who now has a Wikipedia page as well. You can look him up. Um, I was talking about him. Sandy got in touch with me. I said, why don't we put a, black, a plaque on your building? I'll pay for it. And he said, no, no, I'll pay for it. And I want two, one for inside and one for out. So um, that was a, a historic building that was built and operated and families lived there for, I don't know, two generations. Okay, we've got questions that are flipping by. I don't know how to get back. Okay. I think I'm, some questions just went away. Uh, Lisa Butler, what do you think? I, I just cleared the already answered question. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Lisa Butler, what do you think the impact of the farmer's market table placement would be in front of this proposed pocket park? I can take this one, Renee, if you'd like. Um, so that would definitely be a next step would be to um, speak to, and this would be something coordinated with um, the trustees and, um, but basically to speak to the users of the park and make sure that there aren't any conflicts um, with existing uses. Um, the, the opening for the, where the park is, is really only 10 feet wide. So, I mean, ideally it would be great if we could just have, you know, keep that 10 foot wide opening free of farmer's market tents so that people could enter the park um, during farmer's market time, um, which I think it actually will become kind of a popular place during the farmer's market because you can sit and um, have a snack there. Um, so I don't see any problem or conflict coming up, but that would definitely be something that would be discussed. Yes, I, I agree. Like to, I, I like to say that as a marketer, I, I imagine that becomes a premium spot now. <laughs> and I did see that um, Bob Galacki wanted to answer live. I don't know if that was true. Oh, that's just when I'm uh, clearing the questions. I'm just pressing it. <laughs> okay. All right. Skip Barian says, will there be audio accommodation for the visually challenged? I think I can answer that actually. Um, I am a programmer working in voice technology specifically, so I'm happy to work with Lisa on um, voice technology so that there is an audio accommodation for this. Uh, so yes, there will be. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Thank you. Uh, Pat Yasha says, what black history will be featured in the park? I can I can take that. Um, so we've been working for first. Of, first, we thought maybe we should list every name. Then we realized we can't find every name. Maybe we'll never find every name. So um, decided to make it in honor of the whole, the whole community in general, and maybe with a special um, emphasis on the um, handful of Revolutionary War soldiers. Um, but overall for everybody, men, women, and children, all of the generations. So um, the park will just be a place to kind of quietly sit and contemplate this. And if you want to dig into the history and do some research, then you will use that link, which will bring you over to a website where you can look at all, all you want. All right, Eileen Cusick, do the Swayze Park trustees have any concerns? Oh, this is Chris that's asking this. I do know that they have one concern um, that they are they would like a maintenance fund attached to it because, um, you know, if if um, there's something that happens or a tree falls down or whatever, who who would be in charge of that? So we will um, create a maintenance fund for it when we do the fundraising. So uh, I don't know if it's an endowment or what it will be, but we we're addressing that. 
All right. And Aaron Carlson, where on Drinkwater Road did Jude Hall live? Is the structure still there? If so, is there a marker indicating a Black Revolutionary War veteran lived there? Maybe Barbara can take this. He lived on land that's now part of the Phillips Exeter Academy walking trails. And as far as I know, PEA has put up a marker for Jude Hall. There's no existing structure left of his house. There is a, a water a watery area that's called Jude's Pond that's still out there. So that's what you can look for when you, you look for Jude Hall. Thank you. And Jonathan Ring says, is there anything on the town warrant for the in 2021 for the park? And I can answer that as a no. Um, basically, we're still exploring at this time. I don't know if this question would need to go on the warrant or if it's just a, a simple matter of an agreement with the trustees and the select board. Um, some of our next steps will be to, now that we've planted our flag and we've let all the people know how we're doing on this committee, uh, where we are, we have some next steps to take. And that would include, <clears throat> excuse me, going before the select board again and um, giving them our our rough proposal. It would include um, reaching out to uh, some statewide entities like maybe the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire and seeing if there's any collaboration they're interested in um, or entities like that. Um, so we have plenty of work to do right now. Um, so we're, this is not happening anytime soon. I mean, maybe, who knows, but we're, we're, we're treading slowly. We want to make sure we get it right the first time. We don't want to do something that um, turns out to be not a good idea. Okay, Jane. Oh, Jane says, thank you. Thank you, Jane. And Betsy Ferguson, what can we, the public, do to help make this project a success? Anybody? I guess maybe I would say um, when we do go to the GoFundMe or whatever we're going to do, um, you could donate to it if you don't have uh, the means to do that. And if you're more of a researcher, you know, you can dig into any one of these names and kind of help populate the website that we'll put up that will that will help, you know, uncover some of these histories. Um, and in general, I think a word of mouth, if you could speak positively about this project to your neighbors or people you work with, um, tell them how excited you are about it. I think that would be very helpful too. Thank you, I, Betsy. I would also add um, that I, I believe this um, conversation will be available on demand. So, you know, sharing it on your social networks would be great because I think, you know, a lot of people probably can't be here tonight, but just, you know, that's a quick and easy way to spread the word. That's great, Jennifer. Thank you. All right. Herb Moyer, could you envision coordinating programs with the museum event held every July? And uh, actually, the museum is on our panel. So Emma, Emma Bray, or Stratton, is on our panel. She's not on our panel, but she's on our committee. She's been on since the beginning. She's very excited to hear about these soldiers. They want to do some programs around them. Again, just like with our committee, it's hard to research. It's slow researching. It's really hard to find. So um, I envision continued collaboration with the American Independence Museum and their summer festival. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, that's the end of our question. So I'm going to give another minute or two um, for people to, if there's any last minute question. Um, but I'd like to thank you for all for coming tonight and, and thinking about this park. And I think it's a really important, very important project for the town as we go forward and, and for the, the state and the country to have true and inclusive history and bring things that have been hidden for so long in plain sight in our town and just bring them right out into the open. And, and I think that will benefit everybody. Wait a minute. I think another question came in. That's three, four, three or four. Eileen says, or Chris, can New Hampshire state archivist help? What do you think, Barbara? Yes, I, I don't see why not. I mean, we're constantly chasing sources, trying to find information on people. Uh, the research that I do right now, I, I do through um, using online sources. I use census records. I use um, uh, deed records. I use uh, people's 
probate records. Um, sometimes we go to the pauper records if that is available and it's something that we need to check. So, so we're looking through a lot of different places. Sometimes you have to cast your net pretty wide. So certainly there's got to be records up at the state that we don't have in Exeter. So yes, they can help. Great, thank you. Uh, Molly Allen asks, would closing Swayze in the park itself, or the creation of the park itself, be presented in one warrant article? Uh, I can answer that one. That is um, a bigger um, effort that has to do with the uh, Department of Transportation. There's a whole bunch of other stuff going on there where, um, where the select board is uh, considering uh, closing that road, but that's, that's a separate effort from this. I think the, um, the mock-up done there was just based on where we're at right now, but it's a separate um, concern that is ongoing. So I think the, the select board sentiment is to uh, do that, but there are there, there's some issues along the way, but the sentiment is to, uh, in the long term, have Swayze Park be uh, pedestrian only. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I see we had a bunch more comments, but they're all thank yous and wonderful things. And what is that chicken on Barbara's wall? Uh, so I think <laughs> I think that means we're closing down. So I'd like to once again, thank you. I'm going to kind of screen share again the, the final slide to give you something to think about. This is um, how, do, how do I move forward here? Jeez, here we go. All right. Can you all see this? So this is uh, this is what it would kind of be like if you were sitting there. This is this gives you the real feel of it. It's just a quiet space, a small space with a little bit of paving. Um, but I think it's a it's a really nice start, and it will be a really nice commemoration. So 